music issued from inside the riverboat, and Mary went in a trance toward it, passing blind children and elderly women whose minds were not right. A trio of deaf-mute boys was signing. She twisted a hank of hair wringing out the water. The main floor revealed a small orchestra on a stage, and she recognized William Watson, the chord wainer, always eager to play his violin at dance parties. People in wheelchairs were holding the hands of escorts standing before them, twirling them in time with the music. A waltz, a lullaby. A squadron of June bugs found entry, and their bodies flickered like pinprick gratings of stars, signaling each other above the dancing. John was staring at her, his black hair stunning. He was wearing a clean suit. His expression was tenderness harnessed to alertness. People drifted between them, so he was appearing, then getting blocked, then appearing. He was walking steadily, and Mary found her footing and drew toward him. They stopped a few paces away. I had a gift for you, she said. I lost it. You're my gift, he said. He stared at her bare left hand. What's happened? I'm here, she said. Swam here? You were soaked, and I was beyond words. She was shivering, and he took off the light coat he'd worn for an Independence Day on the water and put it on her a summer's day blending into a summer's evening. She stared at the floor, vibrating with a new song, a ballad, and the circling wheelchairs. He said, I've wondered if I'm allowed to be happy coming from the place I do, with the people in it and all that's happened. I understand. Grief, I mean. I must look a wreck. You are beautiful. He reached out and she reached toward him, and they found themselves touching for the first time. One hand moved to the small of her back. Another lifted her right hand higher so they could commence a pattern through the hosts of wheelchairs. Her left hand on his arm, she gripped years of his laboring and town ball playing and needing strength for so many things. He slowed to permit an embrace, her getting the front of him damp, and steered them in arcs he invented. The sunset flattened itself onto the river, red sky onto blue water. Bach and Mozart spilled from the musicians. The faces of those being wheeled were lifted toward the lit-up joy of the dance partners guiding them, everyone content to veer at ease. John and Mary played that game of whispering. Would you love me if I couldn't walk? Would you kiss me if my hair fell out and I went blind? Would you still want me? Would you love me if I forgot how to speak? If I forgot my past and everyone in it? You would have to remember for me that we promised never to leave this behind, this wanting to die of happiness as the wheelchairs circle. The river is slow and the boat is slower. The porthole windows lit in the air and fireflies as the music plays. The water is scarlet, the heart is halved. The sky is red and will wash blue by morning. He pulled her close enough to feel her heart pumping like mad against him, her wet hair on his chest. He put his hand on her head, keeping it there. The body sends its tired blue blood to the heart, where in the divided chambers, hidden but ceaseless, the work goes on, minute by minute, cleaning it to red again. Bless its repetition. Bless that old washerwoman, the heart. And this is the section before they, he leaves for the war. He's snuck out to see her. Spectacles, as he'd vowed to give her. Because he was leaving for the war, John took Mary to Dr. Aloysius Gladwell, whose office had an eye chart and velvet-lined boxes of concave rounds of glass. John held Mary's hand as she climbed into the chair and struggled to read all but the chart's two largest lines. The doctor exhaled a whiff of oil of clove that John prayed was not to mass drunkenness. And the doctor said two glass pieces in the slots of a machine consisting of two large discs that swung on a metal arm over her face. She identified the letters. Dr. Gladwell swung the metal mask away and leaned in again with an instrument enough like a welding tool to upset John, its dot of light so close to her eyes that the vein jelly, the cushion for the optic nerves and the setting for her irises got emblazoned all over the walls. The insides of her eyes turned into a wallpapering of forked lines. As the, as the doctor examined the other violet eye, 
projecting the black and white yellowish of that as well. John stroked the railways and branches, tracing her pathways. Whatever road his country asked him to march along, he would carry this, carry her insides with him. I'll superimpose your railways, your eyes, over the ones I'll travel now. He was touching the inside of her, her eyes spilled over, the first act he recognized as making love, not prelude, but gift. The doctor ground the glass circles with another machine and donned a magnifying tool like a jeweler's loop to adjust tiny screws into a pair of thin gold frames. John helped her step down and put on her spectacles. The outside world became polished and new. The brilliance of the gas, light, and Coke company's street lighting, the clarity of the sidewalk's planks, the shapes of the shadows on a shop's display of sets of teeth dangling on threads. John's face so clear she framed it with her hands. Thank you, she whispered. She wondered if she might look like Ben Franklin, and he assured her that she was a wee bit more attractive. Then, was he really leaving? Did they need to part? I'm here right now, he said, holding her. So much of love is not worrying about what happens next. So much is the possibility that one moment can bear a tenderness that radiates through your remaining days. Waiting and waiting under the oak outside her bedroom window, boughs so sturdy they form a pioneer's idea of a candelabra. The moon expels around cataracts so it can see more clearly, and this rind lands as a pool of light that says, step into me. Everyone is given the chance to write a love story. Everyone gets to be an actor on this greatest of stages. Mary drops down a rope for him to climb. They're grinning because this is out of an old, old story, but now it is theirs. And the cataract is itself so excited by his body in the middle of it that the rope wicks up some moon, glows white also. Here in Illinois, it is easy for him to go hand over hand, lightheaded, to feel her admiring how strong he is. The air is the shade of fog over liquid coal. October, the weft of autumn has unraveled to weave into the warp of the season's first ice. She knows thread and knots. The rope's end tied around her bed's leg will hold, but the bed thumps, lurches impatiently toward him. When she helps him over the ledge, he topples onto her, and the comedy spares them, takes them past the trembling of what they've played out in mind. Now it is real. Smiling, she plants her mouth against his face. He feels oddly forgiving, though he's not sure what there is to forgive here in the clutter of ordinary life. On the end table are the thaumatrope discs he painted of Mary sewing, arm up on one side, down on the other. When they're spun, she hovers in the air, embroidering a work of art in her lap. Her mother claimed to have cracked them by accident. Accident by swift application of a rolling pin, most likely, but absolved. And that whalebone hoop skirt in the closet, a gift from Jane. He hates that anything from the sea might shame women for having legs, but it's just an enormous birdcage. He forgives it. Because of the dark room and the blinds letting the moonlight through the slats, they are kissing striped black and white. He props himself up. Her eyes shine violet in a band of light. He sees tiny images of himself upside down, two, one covering each of her eyes, and he wishes he would move out of the way so he could see her alone. It is the first time he fully understands that happiness is simply the purity of not wanting anything else. And this is why happiness appears so fleeting. How long do we have, he whispers. He means this minute. She's afraid to ask how long the war will take. An hour or two. He'll have to leave before the household awakens. Kissing like slow motion, tumbling off a hill. His heart on her back, thighs at last heart to heart. A fern sways overhead in a tin her sister hammered with nails to let it drip. She seals her mouth against his. And then entering her, hardly any motion at all, locked together, just wrapped tight. And then everything fierce. John covers Mary with a quilt. He dresses rapidly. The quilt is decorated with wheels, and he grips some of the spokes as he hugs her. Already it is over. Don't cry. It's slaughtering him the fineness of her hair. He touches a few strands to let her know he wishes he could touch each one. In a chain along the window's wooden crosses 
is a configuration of ice chips. Look, sweetheart, ice animals, he says. They are of a size that belongs on a charm bracelet, tiny but solid and white. A bear, a dog, a pig, a lion, like diamonds. John kisses Mary's hand. I'm forever at your mercy. We have our whole lives. His friend Jake once said, look at all your name holds, Alves. Lave, slave, ave, vale, see, salve, save, seal. A crashing from the kitchen, Agna the cook at her gainful employ, slam of the dredge box, flour sifting from its holes, all are about to suffer another onslaught of her oat cakes. Mary is shaken by that sensation. She wonders if other people experience when a burst of unreality forms itself into what's real. This is happening. The shift from knowing he'll leave to being startled that they must bear it. Mr. Lincoln vows the war will be short. Mary, you have my word, we'll finally spend a whole night together, then all nights, in a house that's yours and mine. Her thighs are dripping, her pores are sopping, her crying covers his bare chest with a salt he won't wash off for days. They make love again, frightening, frightened they'll be discovered. She whispers, her eyes wet, why does it feel the way it does? No one knows, he says gently. We only know that it's so. Descending backward on the rope, he promises not to die. When he's on the ground, she tosses him a ragged piece of the new tablecloth she's creating, perhaps her dream of water, drops done in whip stitch, a word she taught him. She must have cut it with scissors. You shouldn't have done that. Nightbirds, a V of them traveling. Her window is empty. His body is erased. This is the hour I made for, five in the morning. I worship it. This is now my religion. The sky is still a single black pearl so generous it lets all the white pearls crowd inside it until it bulges with them and lets the white gleam through. And then its skin breaks. Thank you.